Chapter 15 is a, is a terribly difficult chapter. That's good. It's good for me as well. I don't know about everybody else. We just got done with 12 and 13, introduced to the cast. 14 is going to preview chapter 15 all the way through. Now, chapter 15 is going to be looking, at, looking into the general of what's about to go on. And then when we get to chapter 16, it's going to get more specific. Um, we won't even back up to that stuff last week because it, it, was, it, it was getting pretty gruesome there. Um, I got me a little note here to make sure I start out with this. So, what happens during birth pains? Other than the fact that I panic and Charlotte has a baby. There's a whole lot of screaming and yelling, Bob, and then I was in pain. Yeah, all of my screaming and yelling went on. But what goes on is the pain, what happens? That's not mine. And it ain't Scooby Doo, so it ain't Beetle. I'm going to get it. I'm not going to answer it. I'm going to get 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 it. Not only do they get closer together, then what happens? They get harder, harder and harder and harder. Faster, faster. Now, what happens during seven years in the tribulation? Yeah, let me think. How make sure I, I go through this because I didn't write it down. I got, I'll do it this way. Okay, first, oh, let me do it over there. Let me do it over because I already got that up for I'm going to have to have somebody pick this up for me. Okay. During this three and a half years right here, the first three and a half years, what all goes on? The first, first through the six, I believe is all that's in there. Yeah, that's right. First through the sixth seal. Now that's plenty, but that's all that goes on in the first three and a half years. And again, that's plenty of stuff, but each one of them gets a little worse and a little worse. At the midpoint, you're going to get the seventh seal and the first trumpet. And it happens right at the midpoint. They happen together, immediately together. So it all once or bam, bam. But during the last three and a half years, you get the other seven trumpets, two through seven on the trumpets, and then now we're down to the last days. And in the last days, you're going to get all, you're going to get all seven vials or bowls. So you're going to get one through seven bowls. And it's going to all come within just the last days, weeks. I mean, just bam, 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 bam. And each one of these things is just going to continually get worse and worse and worse. So I want you to see that because I've mentioned a couple different times. All this is compared through the Bible to childbirth. And what's going to be the birth? A new heaven. A new planet. You've got a new heaven and a new earth. It's going to be a perfect thing that's born. Um, but that's the only way, I guess, that we can fathom just how this is going to work. It's going to start out, it's going to be bad, but then it's going to get a little worse and a little worse. And I never did make it in Charlotte's childbirth, and it passed about right there. <laughs> when Joey was, now see, see, I was lucky when Joey was born, my dad wasn't really supposed to go in there. So I kind of stayed back, and I, I got sick, and then the nurses spent more time with me than they did Charlotte. <laughs> and they kept coming out there and helping me, and then they'd go talk to Charlotte, and then they'd come back out there, and they finally just told me to sit down over to myself. And uh, 
That's, that's no joke. So whenever we went to have Michelle, by that time, going to court all at once, there's this silly movement. We're going to have the dads go in there. Got no business in there. I don't care what any doctor tells you. I don't care how many of you went in there. You had no business in there. There ain't nothing going on in there you need to be involved in. And I still believe that. Now they got the whole family goes in. Whenever my granddaughter that's two is born, they got the people in there. And my son finally said, only so many can go in there. I think, well, you don't need to be one of them. Well, he's the one paying the bill, so. It's a horrible experience. My little bitty bit. No. No, I, I, I'll worry. I'll be sick when it's all said and done. For three weeks, Charlotte went home, and by the time she got better and the baby's up, I'm still sick as a dog. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so I know for a fact childbirth is a horrible experience for the day. I'm not positive it is for her because I wasn't in there. All I heard was the immediate. Now, I, I sit in the hallway with, with Joey with an old Navy man, and I say, oh, compared to me, I was 18. He was probably 40. And his wife was next to Charlotte in there. And when you're 18, 40 is old. I mean, that's ancient. I'm thinking, what's this old man doing having a kid? He ought to be here for great-grandkids or something. You know? We're sitting out there, and he was smoking, literally, just, and that was inside. Now, that tells you where we were at in the day and age. We're sitting out in, inside, the, inside the building, and he's just smoking and putting them out, smoking and putting them out. Boy, I, boy even the smells is killing me. I'm sick as a dog anyway. And all at once I heard his wife scream and she started cussing. And he got up and he put his cigarette out and he said, Satan beckons. <laughs> and he went in there and she screamed and yelled and she scared Charlotte and my mom who were in the next room. I'm scared to death. This woman's crazy. After a while the guy came back out, his wife quieted down, he lit him up a cigarette and he said, I got a reprieve. He sat there a little bit, she started cussing, and he got up. He did that all night long, back and forth. Childbirth is horrible. That's what this is about. It's telling you, this is horrible. It's going to get worse as it goes. It's going to get closer together, and it's going to get harder. So of all the things I've told you that were bad, we still ain't got bad yet. And it's got really bad already, but it hasn't got bad yet. Chapter 15, verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven. So he's in heaven again. Remember, I kept every chapter, you better realize where you're at. He's, he's in heaven. He sees in heaven. Great and marvelous seven angels having the seven last plagues for, it, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. It's all coming down to the end and there's going to come a point when this is going to be the wrath of God. Now, boy, so, shouldn't some of this have been the wrath of God? Apparently not. Because these seven angels come out and they're the ones carrying the seven bowls or the seven vials that's going to carry the wrath of God. And that's, that, that's spooky enough in itself. So they're filled up with the wrath of God. Who's that waiting on? I guess that's what I'm saying. Who's those, who are those vials waiting on? <coughs> now they're waiting on the sinners. They're, they're waiting to be spilled on the world. On the sinners. But it's going to turn right around now and tell you what's going on for the saints. For all those that are in heaven. For all those who have died during the tribulation. So chapter 2, or verse 2, is going to flip on you now. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over his number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the hearts of God. So then here's all these people and he sees them and they're out there and everything's calm. Anybody ever been to the lake whenever it's really, really calm? Not a... I mean, not a ripple. 
and it looks like glass, don't it? It's just so calm. And so these people are all standing out there. And it's just so calm where they're at. It ain't going to be calm elsewhere. But where they're at, there's peace. <laughs> there's peace there. Now, I don't know if that literally means there's a sea of glass. I know. <clears throat> I mean, it might do it. I'm not. But what it really is talking about is peace. There's no wind blowing in their life. There's no storm coming. There's no problems. Uh, it, it's Everything's like a sea of glass. And they sing the song of Moses. Anybody remember the song of Moses? I don't want to have to go back and read it, but... Does anybody know that Moses was a songwriter? Well, he wrote that when they come out of the land of Egypt. And he wrote two songs. And it wasn't Miriam part of one or something? Mm -hmm. He wrote two songs. He wrote one when they came over the Red Sea. And it's a praise to God. It's in Exodus 15, I believe. And the other one he wrote was right before he died. And him and Joshua sang it together as a, as a duet. And I don't know if anyone of them can sing, but that's who sang it. And that's in Deuteronomy 32, something like that, the end of Deuteronomy. So he wrote one, and 40 years later he wrote another. And they both say the same thing. They, God delivered you from everything you've ever been involved in. He's the creator of the universe, and he's your savior, and he's what's going to fix you. He's your only hope. And give glory to him. So that's what the songs are. So they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, which I don't have a clue what that is. I will when I get to heaven, but I don't know what that song is now. And the song of the Lamb saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. And that's pretty much what Moses' songs were both about. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. This is basically the, I guess you'd say, the swan song. Everybody's about to be brought low. Everybody's about to get I know we've all heard the statement, but sometimes we don't read what we what we hear, we just hear it. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. Boy, that day is coming real quick now. So who's not? Nobody is going to fail to give him the glory. Now some of them have waited too late, haven't they? So look at the difference now between what it says and what it's going to say is going to happen to the sinners, what it's going to happen to the people who refuse, and the people who are saints, the people who are willing to follow God. You've got the difference of seven bowls of God's wrath being poured out on you or a sea of glass and you're playing harps and singing songs. <clears throat> eh, I better keep going here because I'll get... I'll get bogged down right there and I'll watch it. And after that, okay, now he gives you all that there. He says, after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. That's where I want to stop for just a second. Okay. But well, everybody's turn with me. Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 11. I want you to see what it is he's seeing here. Chapter 11. This isn't something that too many preachers preach on, including me. I mean, I got to the page. I'm looking through and I've studied on it. But everybody knows what my Bible preaching Bible look like. That was blank. I haven't preached on it. And I've used this one since 05, 06. The other one's from 96. Look at this other one. I've had this one since 96. So, I wonder if I've ever 
Where we just don't preach. Yeah. That blank too. When I looked that up today, I just had marked it somewhere along the line. I marked it to read. And I read it, but I just never really preached on it. But I want you, I want to show you because it just happened again. <coughs> Chapter 11, verse 15. Everybody with me? Yes. Son of man, thy brethren, even thy brethren, the men of thy kindred and all the house of Israel, holy are they unto him. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Get you far from the Lord. Unto us is this land given in possession. So they all knew the land belonged to them, right? Therefore say, now here's what he tells Ezekiel to say, Thus says the Lord God, Although I have cast them far off among the heathen, now all the people are gone off into captivity, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. So I'm going to be there to take care of them even though I've cast them off, okay? And it's going to go on and say, therefore say. Now here's something else you say. I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered and I will give you the land of Israel. And they shall come thither they shall take away all the detestable things and thereof and all the abominations thereof from hence. Now has that ever happened? Is there any place on this planet where the Jews have all gathered together and there's nothing detestable going on? No, but it's going to happen. Okay? That's what he's talking about. Now let's keep reading because I want you to see it. And I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh, and will give them a heart of flesh. And that means salt. That they may walk in my statutes, keep my ordinances, and do them. They shall be my people, and I will be their God. But as for them whose heart walks after the heart of their detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense their way upon their own head, says the Lord God. Now, that's all going to happen right here. Right there, at the, right there at the end where I got that red X. That's where that's going to happen. Then the cherubims lift up their wings and the wheels beside them and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. Now they're at the temple. They're at the temple and he sees the angels rise up. And the glory of God rises up above. And God tells him, I'm leaving. No more will I be here. But one day, I'm going to gather you all together. And I'm going to bring you back. And I'm going to come back. Now let me keep reading. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain which is to the east side of the city. You remember where the Mount of Olives was when I brought the thing that looked like a lady with a bad hairdo? The Mount of Olives was on the east side of the city. So it says, The cherubims went up, the glory of God, which always came in smoke, it went up and to the east. And it stays over Mount of Olives. Okay? Now stay with me for just a second. Afterwards, the Spirit took me up, brought me into the vision of the Spirit of God in Chaldea to them of the captivity. So it takes them to where the captives are. So the vision that I had seen up went up from me, and then I spake unto them of the captivity, all the things that the Lord had shown me. So, God left. <clears throat> Have you ever thought about the fact that God will flat leave? Nobody believes that, do they? Oh no, it don't matter what we do, God will never leave. <laughs> scary. It's a scary thought. I've been it's reading about when he's leaving. This is the red X. 
Or is this no, he left. Okay. He okay. leaves okay. right, okay. right there. All right. That's where I'm reading. That's what I thought. Okay. And what it said first was it said, "Now I'm going to be back." See, he didn't leave them with, "I'm leaving." He started the conversation with, "I'm going to be back," because they've already been taken into captivity. Okay, they, they're they're being spread throughout the world. There's nothing left, and it's getting worse day by day. And there comes that day whenever he says, now listen, Ezekiel, here's what you tell them. I'm going to come back. I'm going to make sure everything's straight. I'm going to bring them all together. And I'm going to be their God, and they're going to be my people. And everything's going to be perfect. And for all those people who don't like it, for all those people who rather have the detestable things, uh, they're in trouble. And then it says, and his spirit rose up. And it went away. Now let me ask you this. Now I jump forward. Did he not come back in the person of Jesus Christ? Yes. yes. Okay, now bear with me a second. Jesus comes back to bring them all together. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. What was lost? The people were lost. They were lost from here. He came back to put the, put it all in order. Now what they do to him? Crucified. They crucified him. When he rose from the dead, what did he do? He went to the Mount of Olives and he went right straight back. The exact same way it happened 600 years earlier. Now, where's he coming back to? Where's his feet going to touch the ground? The Mount of Olives. Is God a liar? No. God says, I'm coming back. And I'm coming back to put everything in order. But before he gets back, there's going to be some real nasty choices to make because he's not coming back to mess with people. The God of grace, which God is this we're talking about? I'm sorry, it's God of wrath. And that, that is what fire means. When it says it's glass and fire, fire literally means judgment. So, so God tried to work with them. We've studied that over and over, right? Tried to work with them and they don't listen. Are we any different today? He tried to work, they don't listen. Finally he just said, okay, that's the way you want it. Have that work. Me and my spirit, we'll just go back to heaven. He goes back to heaven, sends his son in flesh to try to call them all back together again. Of course, they didn't. He knew that, but they didn't. They crucify him. He raises up, and he ascends back from the same place. And then, then you read in Revelation. Now, let me go back and read Revelation again now that we read that. Read that again. Because this is what John is seeing. John is seeing the next step in all of that. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, which the seven vials, I'm going to want to talk more about that in the next <coughs> chapter. Clothed in pure and white linen, having their breasts girded with golden girdles, and one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. Okay? Now everybody with me? He's not coming back to be the, the play no kissy face, huggy, huggy, lovey, lovey, <laughs> all this stuff that people think, you know. I guess I got just enough of that old-fashioned Baptist in me. <laughs> that I think people really play God lightly. Grandfather God. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's George Burns. Mm -hmm. He's not George Burns. You know, for whatever reason, people want to think Jesus was a hippie and God is George Burns. And they're just loving and kind and they couldn't possibly do anything to anybody. How could they read their Bible and believe that God is not going to come back in judgment? There's no way to read it that way. 
And it's not anything they don't deserve. It's totally deserved, and guess who else deserves it? All the rest of us who are actually on the, glass, the sea of glass. So that shows you right there, God is loving. He is a God of grace. But that's got a limit. How many parents, uh oh How many parents are only parents of grace? And no matter what, you didn't get accused of that. I never did either. But now Charlotte did. Our, our kids think that way. How many parents are only parents of grace? And no matter what their children do, it's okay. And how do those children end up every time? Brats. Brats. <laughs> no, I got brats, and I was mean to mine. Charlotte said, you're too rough on them. What about Eli? Everybody remember the story of Eli's children? What happened to Eli's children? God killed them. Because Eli wouldn't make a mind. What about Samuel? Now Samuel was Eli's almost adopted son. I mean, he was like his godson. Raised him up. He saw all that went on with, with his kids. He saw Eli's kids do so bad. Guess what Samuel's kids did? All the same stuff. And guess what God did? God killed Samuel's kids. Well, we don't get those sermons, do we? God will kill your kids. That's what I'm saying to you. I'm just saying that there comes a point whenever you've got, whenever you transition from grace to judgment. Otherwise, people never learn. Um, in my family, they usually went straight to judgment and then went to grace. My dad. My dad whooped me. Really and honestly, dad only whooped me one time. Um, no, no, it wasn't. <laughs> but now, you know, I had a mom and a grandma that whooped me every day. Dad knew it, so I guess he felt bad for me. Uh, but they couldn't hurt me. Dad could hurt you. Whenever I was in the second grade, I decided that I learned all I needed to know about life, school, all they did was send us out to recess all the time. I ain't got time for no recess. Not a joke. If I, if I won't play, man, I got people at the house to play. You know, I got brothers that's a lot better ball playing than these kids. You know, half of them can't even run. You know, I, I'll go home and play. I got horses to ride. I got, I got stuff to do. You know, there's Indians need killing. You know, and I, I got a horse. <laughs> that's right. You know, I. And that's kind of the way I was. And plus, they were making the kids learn stuff like three, three times four or stuff like that. And I'd learned that before I went to school. Because I, I guess my parents were afraid I was dumb, so they taught me this stuff in advance so I'd have a little head start. You know, all of us got a handicap. So I had that little handicap ahead of me. And I remember one day in the second grade, it was, I ain't got time for this. It's nonsense. So whenever they let us out for recess, I walk home. Well, little does a second grader realize distance. Yeah, right. I don't have a big grasp on distance. So by the time it got dark, I hadn't made it home. And by the time it got about 10 o'clock, I hadn't made it home. Were you lost or was No, I don't know where I was at. I was just walking home, but I wasn't getting nowhere. You know, I mean, yeah, yeah, we lived in the middle of nowhere. I went from nowhere to nowhere. And it's a long way between nowhere and nowhere. But I knew where I was going. I just wasn't making it any time in there. I stopped at a couple people's houses because I knew everybody. I actually stopped me a sandwich with one of my cousins. You know, I'm walking on. That, this is not a joke. This is the absolute truth. I stopped and had a soda pop. And, and um, matter of fact, um, Glenda Rollins' niece is married to one of the families I stopped and run soda pop at their house. The Tallies. I mean, they were friends of the family. I was buying it. It's a long, it's a long ways home. And the old, old man Tally asked me what I was doing, and I said, I'm walking home. Okay, whatever. You know, it's a different day and age, I guess, different place. 
I got almost to the house, and my aunt and uncle was one of the crowd that was looking for me. My aunt and uncle come down, and my uncle said, Boy, where have you been? I said, I walked home. From where? From school. I don't have time for them people. He said, well, if I was you, I would prepare myself. Because you are about to get you a woman that will not quit. So I went to the house, and I got me a bunch of books, and I put them in my britches. And I'm not no dummy. I got them just, here come Dad in. Boy, he walked in, and man, he jerked his bell off, and he, pow, and hit me, and it went, pop. And I'm standing there, I thought, hmm. I didn't know Uncle Lightning really had that much good advice, but... Dad popped me one more time and he stopped for a second and he got me by the arm and he raised me about that high. And he started whooping me at the ankles. <laughs> and he whooped me from the ankles to where the belt, to where the books went. Took me into the bedroom and just slung me up against the wall and I fell in the bed. Oh, he was mad. He walked out. Probably 30 minutes. He come walking back in and he opened the door and you'd have to know my dad when he was sober. When Dad was sober, he was one of the, just a great person. He walked back in and he said, did you get any supper? And I said, I stopped at the tallies and they gave me a Dr. Pepper. And he said, I'll get you a hamburger. And he went back in the other room and he came back and Mom had cooked hamburgers and he gave me a hamburger and he went on about his business until the day my dad died, I never heard about him. Well, no, that ain't the whole story. Just because I got whooping don't mean I got to go back. But I went back to school the next day, and of course there was a big rigmarole about me walking off. And then here's the principal standing out in front, every kid getting off that bus. Now the principal wasn't from there, so he didn't know me. And every kid getting off my bus, he would say, are you Jimmy Collins? No. Are you Jimmy Collins? No. When he got to me, he said, are you Jimmy Collins? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think God would want to have this deal. I ain't no dummy. <laughs> so I went to class. And when I got to class, Mrs. Christopher, who was actually married to my dad's first cousin, said, did the principal talk to you? Yeah. He did. <laughs> he said, she said, okay. Well, it wasn't long until Gene Jones, who was married to my dad's first cousin, who was the juvenile officer, truant officer, we called him, he showed up with the principal. He opened the door and he said, Jimmy, come here. And I went out there and then, you know, Gene knows me. I ain't getting away with it now. He got me out and he said, what'd you do? And I said, I walk on. Why'd you walk on? I said, because there ain't nothing here I need to learn. And he stood there just a little bit and he said, well, if you ain't Joe Collins, made over. And he turned around and walked out. And whenever I became a juvenile officer, Gene was a retired juvenile officer, and he still remembered it, thought it was hilarious. But see, I got the whooping, but then he come and got me, and I, I let's get you a hamburger. Okay. Let's move on now. But that's what happened with the Jews back here. God left. He said, there you are. You want it, buddy. You get it. Just get in there and jump part and get, get all of it you want. Ain't that right? And Because they chose it. And then right here, Jesus comes back and offers them. And what do they do? They turn it down. So what did he do? He went right back to heaven. And all this time, look at all them Jews have been through. Think about that for a second. Yeah. They have been through heck and high water. But there's going to come this day whenever he's going to come back. And he's going to finish the whooping. For those that don't want to mind. And for those that will mind, let's fix you a hamburger. We got it all straight. It's all in one. Now, like I say, it's not really that much different from us. We all deserve the whooping. Verse 8. That's where it's going to end. And this is my favorite part of the whole thing. I don't know if I told you the right. I don't know if I led you upright to get you here, but we'll find out in a second. Because if I did, it makes sense, and if I didn't, it won't make no sense. 
And the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God. What happened here when he left? He went up from a hand, went away. And the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God. He's returned. He's coming back for his people. And then here he's talking about Jews. We're with him. He's coming back for the Jews, but we're the ones with him. And from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. So he set it all up in order, but nobody was allowed in because we got to finish stomping. Remember how in the last chapter we learned that he stomps, basically stomps everybody to death until everybody is done away with, you're not allowed in there. But he brings it back. They can see it. It's, it's an amazing thing. All the pain and the childbirth, all through that. I think this. Maybe I'm wrong, you disagree. You know, just my opinion. When Charlotte went to have Joey, I went in there with her just for a second before they were going to make me leave. And, you know, in my family, you didn't go in there. So I went in there, and it's all fine. And she said, I need a drink of water. I'm really thirsty. So I went to the door, and the nurse said, she don't need it. She can't have any water. Well, I got upset. You can have some ice chips. Just put them in your mouth and let them melt, but you can't have any water. Well, then a little bit later, she said, I need something for the pain. And so I wandered back out through there, and I said, my wife's in there, and she said she needs something for the pain. And they said, no, she don't. She needs to have the pain, have faith. That's how it was at that point in time. Now, at least where we're from, if it don't hurt, you ain't doing no good. And the worse it hurts, the more they try to make you walk. Get up and walk around the hall for a while. And the whole time, I'm, I'm, I'm getting sicker and sicker and worse and worse because I don't want her hurt. How do you do? I, I, I guess I believe with all my heart whenever Jesus looks down in Jerusalem and I, that there's... The one thing in that Bible that just tears my heart out, and I'm a hard person, is when Jesus looks down and says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you up as a hen gathers her chicks? And I say that all the time because that's one thing in there that can just rip me up. Because I know it's going to be the same thing here. I'm not going to see all the death and destruction. I'm already either going to be raptured away or I'm going to be dead and I'm going to be there. I'm not going to see all that because there's no... But God's going to see that. Jesus Christ is going to see all this death and destruction. Everything that he died for, they didn't accept it and now he's going to destroy it. That's got to be a horrible thing. But at the same time, it's a childbirth. At the same time, he died so that we would go to well, accept him. Can't have But he still died for the ones even that he's going to destroy. And back to the parent. No matter how bad the kids are, my poor old Aunt Lucy. That ain't Scooby Dooey. <laughs> my poor old Aunt Lucy. Let me tell you a story, and it's funny, but maybe it'll make a point, and then we'll go. <coughs> My Aunt Lucy had a boy named Thurlow. He was quite a bit older than me. I called him Uncle Thurlow all the time because he was always around, and he was my—he was actually my mom's nephew, so he's my first cousin. But he was quite a bit older than me, and then our 
We call everybody that's that much older than us Aunt Uncle. And when they got to a certain age, they were Granny and, you know, Granny and Grandpa. But he was Uncle Thurlow, even though he was my first cousin. Bless his heart, he got, let, let, me, let me say this, he got saved in the last couple of years of his life, he lived a good life. Now let's back up. <laughs> oh, he was a mess. There was a Harker's truck. And some of you have heard me tell this. Bear with me anyway, because I want to make a point and then we'll go on. There was a Harker's truck. Now Harker's was a meat company out of Memphis that came over and they, people from West Plains would go and get meat and take over there and run a meat route. Meat truck broke down. They parked it out on the side of the highway and Thurlow came along in the meat truck sitting there so he just got all the meat out and took it home. I guess he thought he was saving them the trouble of it going bad or something. We went over to their house and Lucy, now my Aunt Lucy, this is her boy, her baby boy. And all she loved him. Now folks, he'd been in and out of the pen. He'd been arrested for everything known to man. But now Aunt Lucy loved him. And it was never little Thurlow's fault. Now little Thurlow was 6'6 six, six and weighed about 290. Had tattoos all over him. He had a dotted line tattooed and it said, cut here. <laughs> he'd been shot five or six times in poker games and he'd been stabbed, no telling how many times in a penitentiary. He'd been shanked, lived through it all. But this is little Thurlow. He never done anything. No, it was all the way So we got there and she's sitting out in the front room, me and my dad, and we, we had borrowed the squirrel dog. We went squirrel hunting, and, and our squirrel dog had died, so we went by and got Lucy's squirrel dog. Man, we killed us a mess of squirrels, and we took the dog back and gave her a couple of squirrels, and Thurlow said, come on here, let me show you something. I said, Jimmy, go get underneath my bed and get a couple of them big Virginia salted hams. <laughs> hmm, I like Virginia salted hams now. So I went in there, and I crawled in underneath there in that bed, and underneath was completely covered in salted hams. Now, I'm probably 10 or 11. Man, I threw a couple of them things out there, and they, oh, they that big around. Went, Woo! Man, we're going to eat now. The way we went, I'm dragging them things out there. I don't know they're as big as I was. Dad said, where'd you get them? And Lucy said, oh, we got them on sale. And Dad said, yeah, okay. Well, we walked out, and whenever Dad walked out, he said, she ain't got them on sale, all right. It was one of them five-finger discounts. <laughs> Well, me and my other brother went, we got the truck, throwed them hands in there, and we went home with our squirrels and our hams, and we took the squirrels in, put them in the freezer, and cut one of them hams open. My goodness. Mom and Grandma come walking in. Now, my mom and dad weren't saved at this time, but now Grandma, she was strict. I mean, she was what, what most people would call hard shell. She, they come walking in, she throwed her purse down, she said, did you hear about the Harker's truck that broke down on the side of the road? And Dad, said, he said, no. And she said, somebody robbed that thing said it was full of Virginia salted ham. Now, this is not a lie. Everybody thinks I lie when I tell you this is the absolute gospel. Dad said, he quit, boys. <laughs> <laughs> We're piling it away, me and my oldest brother and my next to three of us and dads. And I've got two nephews. So there's six of us and we are piling the Virginia salted ham down. And I'm here. And Grandma walked in there and she sees this one big old ham there and we're chopping on that one and she said, where'd you get that? And Dad said, no, no, it wasn't Dad. I think it was Walter, my oldest brother. He said, Thurlow's got a whole room full of them. <laughs> and Grandma said, the devil's meat. You'll go to hell for eating such as that. And Dad said, I'll go with a full stomach. And he just <laughs> that so we're all eating so all at once I realized my hand was about to get gone. Grandma grabbed the big one up and threw it in the fireplace. Now, this is a sacrilege. You know, this is worse than the death of the hand. But not a joke, I'm telling you. So I'm cutting that thing up and I stick it in the pocket. And my brother, now I'm only 10 or 11, but my oldest brother saw me do it. And he, yeah, boy, I mean, he's chopping it up. We had it in our pants and our pockets. <laughs> we, we're carrying ham. Grandma is slapping and knocking and yelling, let go of the devil's meat. <laughs> the devil wants some. He'll have to cut his own. Because I'm getting my car. This is Jimmy's car. She run every one of us out there and she burnt that thing up. Next thing you know, Thurlow's gone back to the penitentiary. And of course, Aunt Lucy. 
What in Portal Erlo's fault? <laughs> Thank that there was somebody with him that convinced him to do that. <laughs> it was the devil's mate, Gordon Brown. <laughs> See, that's how a parent really is, isn't it? Well, I God, God's love never gives up on us as long as we're breathing. As long as we're here, as long as there's a chance. God's love is always there just like that parent. Jesus Christ died for even Thurlow. Now, the first time Charlotte ever met Thurlow, she screamed and ran out of the room. <laughs> he, just, he just came in the house and said, hey, he had gold chains on and he's got a big ring on every finger. Charlotte told the door open to walk in had a brand new pickup. You just you had to know him. He would he would have gave you the shirt off his back, but if you wanted yours, he'd have stole it when you wasn't looking. <laughs> now, third old got saved. Matter of fact, he got saved while I was here last time. Old like the very end of 05, start of 06. Lived a fabulous life. He was dying of cirrhosis of the liver. For about a year, lived a tremendously Christian life. Somebody went in his house, shot him in the back of the head, and burned his house down. Life will catch up with you. Life will catch up with you every time. There always comes a judgment day. Now, who he did, who did that? I don't know. But of all the stuff he did, there was finally a judgment day, and he knew it was coming. He wasn't a dummy. There was nobody going to try to do that whenever he's healthy. But my brother told me later that he'd been waiting for it for months. And he was okay with it. There's going to come a time of judgment. Now that's kind of what this is. As much as God loves these Jews, as much as he's done for them, there's still going to come a time of judgment. He'll do anything in the world for him. But there's also a day of judgment. And when that day comes, they might as well be ready. They don't see it, do they? Nope. They're the ones that are blinded. I work with the ones. They're, they're, they're blinded to it, according to the Bible. Uh, they're blinded to it right up until here. Whenever the 144,000 are pulled out, and I'll do this. I'll lie to you now. Turn to Thessalonians. I'm gonna, I'll lie to you. Let me, do, let me read one more thing because of what that says. And I'll, I'll, I'll. Thessalonians chapter 2. I was going to stop right there, but let me go on. See, from, from that cross, from the day that Jesus ascended until this day, the, 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 the Jews are blind. They can't see it. They don't understand it. It makes no sense to them. Now, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it's going to tell you what's going to happen on that day and what this is going to look like. And I'll just read it and then we're, we're about done here. 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's talking about Satan here, the Antichrist. It's talking about the Antichrist being revealed. Uh, verse 5. I'll just start reading because I'm going to read that real quick. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now you know what withholds that he might be revealed in his time. What is it that what is it that holds back? The Holy Spirit holds back the Antichrist. Satan cannot do what he wants here because the Holy Spirit's here. For the mystery of the iniquity that always does already work. Only who who now lets will let. Until he be taken out of the way. So, until the Holy Spirit is taken out, the Antichrist can't come. He's not, he, he can't do it. So, when the Holy Spirit's taken away, we're taken away with him. And then shall that wicked be revealed. So, the Antichrist can't come until the Holy Spirit is out of the way. Whom the Lord shall consume with the Spirit of his mouth, shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, which is here. Okay? 
So here he's going to come, and here the Lord's going to come. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, which is the Antichrist, with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness and unrighteousness, and them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth. And it says, believed, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now I'm going to leave it right there, but from right out, 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 okay. From right here to right here, the Jews are blinded. They can't see it. But from right here to right here, everybody else is blinded that had the chance here. Why? I don't know. But that is, that is what it says. There's a delusion involved. They'd rather believe a lie. Can you imagine how bad it's got to be to see all of this and hear at the last but still not believe but it's going to be millions upon millions. Could those last miles right there at the end, could they not be like a purge of the earth? Uh, that's, that's exactly what it is. I mean, you know, like when a woman goes in, she have, they have to have hot water and clean towels. And yep. So that's more or less not God sticking his tongue out at anybody that's left. No, so that's, that's cleaning it up. Cleaning up the earth for the new birth. Things are destined to a certain point in our day. Oh, the, this line I've drawn out, that's destiny. Yeah. There's nothing anybody's going to do about it. Now. It's already been prophesied as what's going to happen. We just live on it. Every one of us lives somewhere on that line. Yeah. And it's up to you what you do. Well, that would be the only difference it would make is that the individual that either believes or doesn't believe. That's why the Holy Spirit dwells within us. Right. The Holy Spirit dwells within me because I have the ability to make choice. Right. You know, he made one statement, and I'll shut up, but uh, till the Holy Spirit was, is withdrawn, Satan can't come. Yep. Jesus said that himself, a kingdom cannot be divided against itself. Yes. You know, it's either God's domain or it's Satan's. No. There you go. The thunderings have started. <laughs> Any more questions? Let's all stand. Let's all make a run for it. Lead us in a quick withdrawal. Dean dismisses with a word of prayer.